All right, good morning, Harrison. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Ngari Video Confidence Podcast. Um, for those of you listening, Harrison is going to be talking to us today about how to get your videos viewed more. And we're going to be looking at this through the angle of search engine optimization, algorithm optimization, because truthfully online, it's not just about creating good content. It's also about being strategic and how you create it so that the algorithms will put in front of more eyeballs. Uh, and that's something I personally don't know a whole ton about. Uh, so I'm happy to talk to Harrison here. Um, before we get started, Harrison, could you just kind of introduce yourself and explain uh, what you do to people? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be on here. Um, to give a little bit of my background, I'm currently working with the director of uh, SEO at Audible, doing content strategy and applying technical SEO as well as creativity to help my clients craft good content that's not only going to resonate with the target audience, but rank on Google as well. So uh, double whammy, good, <laughs> good combination. So yeah, I'm excited to share some of my insights that I've learned over the years with you. Cool. Well, before we uh, go too much further, just for people out there who are um, unaware, what even is SEO? So I've had a lot of people asking this question. So essentially to put it in layman's terms, my focus is specifically on Google, but it really applies across platforms. It's essentially making tweaks to people's content or websites so that they rank higher in search results. So to put it into perspective, on Google, on average, people click on the first link that pops up 70% of the time. So even if you're ranking as the third or fourth link on a really popular topic of conversation, you're, lo you're losing out on thousands of clicks. So we'll go in, make the necessary changes, and as a result, hopefully get you to bump up to that top spot so that you're gonna be getting as much exposure as possible on high converting keywords. Awesome. Um, one thing that I have been thinking about quite a bit that I'm kind of curious to hear your viewpoint on. Obviously, there's no good you know, doing all the search engine optimization if your content is crap, right? If it's just empty, fluff, doesn't resonate, doesn't connect, you're not gonna get very far. Um, but at the same time, it seems like, at least on the internet these days, it's not good enough to, um, you know, in Field of Dreams, the, uh, the movie, you know, the, the, the slogan for that film is, if you build it, they will come. And it, it doesn't seem like that's enough anymore. It doesn't seem like creating high quality content is enough. You have to have a strategy in place of how to get it viewed by more people. But I'm curious to your thoughts as to, I guess, weighing the relative importance of both of those things. Obviously, they're both important, but where do you see kind of the scale sitting as far as how important each aspect is? Sure. I'm, I'm going to start off by plugging a really good book that I recently read. It's called Think Like Google by Tom Garinger. Uh, great guy. Also on LinkedIn, definitely would recommend checking him out. And the core philosophy of his book was the key to ranking well on Google is to create more value than the existing content that's already out there. So it's, it's definitely a factor using the right keywords and things like that. But the main thing that he does and that I have really applied to my mindset is going and looking at those top keywords, looking at what the competitors have to offer and keeping in mind what's missing. What could make this better? Is it, is it missing a video? Would a bulleted list at the top be really helpful? Is it missing links to external uh, web pages that are worth checking out? And when you kind of think in that mindset, even if the top three articles are really well written, there's always something more that you could add that's going to make it better and create more value for the type of person that's searching that keyword. So I would say thinking about it in that perspective and also thinking as any marketer has to do from the perspective of your target audience, is this blog that's currently ranking number one really applicable to the person that's searching that specific term for that specific reason? So those are the two big things that I would say are extra important to stand out as we get this <laughs> influx of tons and tons of content just being created on a daily basis. Now you talk about, you know, providing value and keywords and stuff like that. Um, I guess the question for you would be, how do you know what's going to be valuable to people, right? As you're creating your YouTube channel, your podcast, your website, blog posts, like, I mean, do you just like guess what people will be valuable from the experience you've had working with people? Do you just base it on conversations you've had with customers? Or is there something that you do more empirically to know what's going to be valuable for people? 
So it, the biggest components of my aspect of SEO, which is mostly content strategy versus like technical SEO is keyword research and competitive research. So if it's okay with you, I, I could definitely walk you through one of the platforms that I like to use on a regular basis and kind of <laughs> show you the steps quickly yeah. of how I discover the perfect piece of content. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Sure. Let me share my screen. Yeah. So for those of you listening, the podcast version of this, Harrison is going to be sharing with us um, on his screen, you know, how uh, the, the SEO tool, or the uh, keyword tool that he uses. So what is this tool? This one is called SEMrush and it's, uh, it's my personal favorite. Re it's great for all sorts of things about SEO, not only um, the content side of things, but the technical side as well. But it's my go-to for keyword for uh, keyword research. So I'm trying to think of we'll do content strategy just since that's kind of the core focus here. So this is called the keyword magic tool. Um, so you can type in any any keyword that you're interested in finding out more about, and then it'll provide you with this data. So this number here, the 6600. That's a monthly search volume. So that's the number of people in the United States a month that are searching this specific keyword. Here is just trends you could see. Sometimes it's like like coronavirus. I'm sure if I search that, the spike would be up here in March since it was <laughs> obviously a hot topic at that point and would probably be going down somewhat ever since. So this is just a good way to identify if like a, a keyword is is seasonal versus getting search volume year round. This number right here is keyword difficulty, and that's on a scale from one to 100 of how difficult it is to rank for that keyword. Typically with my clients, we shoot to be in that 60 to 70% range, and anything below that is like really feasible to rank for. Uh, and then this one is cost per click, which is essentially if you ran paid ads on this term on Google. So there's ones that pop up up top with that green, uh, with that green ad next to them. Even if you're not doing paid ads though, I still find this to be really worthwhile just because if something has a high cost per click, that suggests that it's a high converting keyword, which means the people that are searching that term, chances are they're looking to pay or looking to inquire more about getting whatever product or item they happen to search for. So. This is super telling. Um, so usually once I go here and I collect relevant keywords around the topic area that I'm interested in, I'll go to Google and I'll search the, um, the top performing key or top performing blog posts or pieces of content that exist. And that's when I go in this one, if it's, if it's this top banner at the top, that means they're doing something really right because Google thinks that that's the most valuable insights that people could get of all the existing content out there. So that's when I go in and apply, as I mentioned before, what's missing from this. So this I can see there's no video, which I'm sure we'll get into shortly. Um, I'm just skimming it here. Yeah, there's no video. You could probably add some imagery. There's a lack of imagery on this post. So just being conscious of what's missing from this that would make it even better than it already is. That's when you can go in write your blog post, create your video content, and think about it from a standpoint of what could I be doing better. So you could do the same thing realistically on any platform that you're using as well. So YouTube applies a very similar mentality since it is owned by Google. So you can go watch Brian Dean's video on the ultimate content marketing strategy for 2020 and apply that same mentality. What's something that I really like about content strategy that would create value for the viewer that's currently missing from this video. And that's how you can kind of rank not only in the search results, but in the recommended videos as well. If you can create a great video on content strategy, similar heading, similar tag, you can also rank over here and that's a good way to get exposure as well. So just thinking about what can I add? What, what's everything included in this and what could I add to make it even better? And in that case, more often than not, you're going to get a good chance to get some, some real exposure on your content. So uh, I'm, I'm curious now and kind of for selfish reasons here, um, this interview <laughs> that we're doing here, right. It's going to be posted up to YouTube um, probably in a couple of weeks here. And I want as many people as possible to see it. Um, and unlike some of the conversations we do, this is a topic I imagine there is surface traffic out there for, right. How to get more people to watch my videos, et cetera. So 
can we can we do a little bit of research right now for this interview topic an interview about you know how to get more of your videos watched through seo and you know keeping algorithms happy how how sure. would i write the description of the youtube video what keywords should i include to maximize the chance that this video gets seen sure so i should have showed it while i was sharing my screen but there is from a podcast and video standpoint that keyword research tool that i pulled up is really helpful as well there's a an option that you can click to see questions that are being asked around that topic. So I would imagine some of the questions are, what is content strategy? How can I use content strategy? So in this case, it would be, how can I rank on YouTube? How can my videos get more exposure? And when you look at those questions before you craft a piece of content, it makes it really clear, all right, the people that are trying to find out about this, this is exactly the phrasing that they're using when they're asking this. And you can do that content research and see how people are answering and then craft something that's even more valuable. So I would just say the main thing is just to really focus on delivering the best piece of content you could possibly deliver to create value for your target audience. And on YouTube specifically, I'm not a huge expert in YouTube SEO, but I know for a fact that ranking well on that recommended video side of things, YouTube's main incentive is to keep people watching as long as possible on the video. So if you see that, that that other video had a 15 minute view time, if you can make a video on the same subject that's 18 minutes long, covers all those topics and adds more value, YouTube's gonna say, all right, people are gonna watch this one for three minutes longer. The view time is longer on average, bump it up. We're gonna put it at the top. And that's a really clear objective to, <laughs> to get on top of the, the YouTube search results. Yeah. So I imagine the idea would be, I would, you know, use this keyword research tool, try to look for questions people are asking related to content strategy, video views, stuff like that. Um, and then I guess I would work some of those into the description that I write of the YouTube. Definitely video. the description. And I know that tagging is very much important on YouTube as well. So that's something to be conscious of as well. And incorporating those relevant keywords and that exact phrasing, that the monthly search volume is uh, is showing you, utilize that in your description and and in the title too, if possible. If what is content strategy is the most popular search term around that subject area, put that in your heading, put that in your description and put it in your tags as well. Interesting, okay, cool. Yeah, like I said, I'm definitely more of the, you know, if you build it, they'll come philosophy where I figure I'll just make good content and the rest of the work itself out. So this is uh, this is new to me. <laughs> it's definitely right, a combo then. of the two. Yeah. Now here's a question that I that I run into a fair amount, um, especially with this podcast, right? I have found that a lot of things that people really need help on are things that are not being keyword searched, like searched in Google. People are just not looking for it because they don't even know it exists and that they even should be looking for it. They don't know what questions they should ask, right? Because my podcast is all about working through discomfort, becoming more confident on a camera. And a lot of the things that I hear coming up over and over again, as far as ways people have helped themselves. Again, I, I try, you know, doing searches uh, in Google, you know, with, with the keywords everywhere tools, what I use, and nobody's searching for it. So that's part of the reason why I've kind of said goodbye to, you know, SEO optimized content and just said, I'm going to make the best content. I'm going to give people what I know they need, even though they're not looking for it. But the question for you is, I mean, in your experience, how much do you let your content strategy be guided by what people are searching? Right. And how much do you hold true to what you know the world needs, what your mission is, what is authentic to your brand and just like produce content, even though nobody's searching for it, or at least not a lot of people are searching for it. So I, I think it's a really good balance of what you were saying and SEO for what we're doing. So for a lot of my clients, there are certain blog posts that we're creating that the main objective is just to rank really high on Google for a term that directly relates to their brand and their target audience. So in that case, those blog posts are usually like, like for example, I have a co-working space as a client. We wrote a blog post called what is a serviced office recently? That was <laughs> definitely wasn't super fun to write and work on. It wasn't like a, I don't think we're going to get a Pulitzer Prize for it or anything, but um, that was just an SEO tailored one. But the at the end of the day, you know your business and you know, especially based on asking people, what is it that you want to learn about creating video? I think even if something doesn't have a ton of monthly search volume, you still have people subscribe to your email list. 
You still have people that are going to be searching that term in the future. In all honesty, if the monthly search volume is low for something that you're creating content around, building that content as it becomes more prominent is going to put you high up on the search engine results on any platform before it even takes off. So I'll give you an example. Last year, I, I had a client that was a an online wallpaper sales company. So you could buy you could buy wallpaper, they would print it and ship it out to you. I had them write, I noticed that 2019 wallpaper trends was a popular monthly search. So I recommended that they write a blog post called wallpaper 2020 trends in like October. And because no one had created content for wallpaper 2020 yet, people were still focused on 2019 they were ranking months before people started searching that term. And then it got, that's their biggest viewed blog post to date. They got over, they got like 40,000 clicks on it this year. So it's because they focused on ranking before it became a hot topic. Uh, they kind of beat the rush, you know what I mean? So, so crafting content that you could imagine will increase in search volume down the line is actually a really good strategy to rank <laughs> before everybody else. Man, now that you say that, I feel like I could have gone back in like March and made some, you know, some maybe some COVID specific content, right? About, you know, how to make your home office look better or how to be more comfortable on Zoom or, you know, topics related to uh, to what people are now going through with quarantine. It's not too late. I think especially with something like your business, people are going to come around <laughs> pretty soon. It's like COVID has just expedited the process of like, forward thinking work style. So I yeah. think, uh, I think you're still going to be in pretty good shape after all this. So maybe it sounds like if I'm hearing this right. You know, you create content that's true to your brand, true to your mission, even if no one's searching it. Um, if you have reason to believe search volume will go up in the near future, that's great. But even if not, it's still good to be true to your brand, but you should have separate pieces of content, which are entirely dedicated to SEO where it's not necessarily interesting or, you know, uh, you know, the heart of your business, but it's necessary to get eyeballs. And then once people come for one article, the idea is I hope they'll see something else, right? Those, that catches their interest. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it ties in pretty nicely as well to the fact that even if an, even if a video that you post only gets a hundred views, but it's in a super hyper-focused niche within your community, if somebody is searching and stumbling upon that video, chances are they're the type of person that you want to see that video. So it's like you get 80,000 people watching a generic video that aren't your target audience at all. And you're not really benefiting from them viewing it versus you can get 100 or 500 people that are your exact target demographic watching your video or clicking on your article. That's super beneficial. So even those, especially starting out, those low search volume easy to rank for terms are a great place to start. And as you build attention and get exposure from those, that's when you can kind of work your way up to those more intense, harder to rank for pieces of content. Cool. All right. All right. So that's, you know, that, that's the process of figuring out what your content is, right? You use the, you know, the search tool um, to figure out what kind of keywords are ranking and you build a content strategy based on that. And again, it's very much focused on how can I be just a little bit better than what the current top ranking piece is. Um, so that's how you pick your topics. Once you've picked your topics from kind of a video standpoint, how do you decide where to put that video, right? Cause you can put that video on your website. You can embed that video into a blog post. You can put that video on YouTube you can put it on LinkedIn. You can put it on Facebook you can put it on Instagram. There's so much stuff you can do with videos. How do you decide where to put a video or just put the same video everywhere? I definitely think that, that putting it on as many platforms as possible is a good approach because the more exposure, the better. And the more eyes you can get it in front of, obviously, the better. But it, it also comes back down to, like I was saying before, you need to know your target audience. Uh, that website that I was talking about that's a wallpaper brand, they have a ton of success on Pinterest because it's a lot of like interior designers and women that are interested in like home goods and home products and things like that. So they get tons and tons of exposure from Pinterest. Whereas my client that's selling office space, I mean, they have some cool office spaces, so they might actually do all right on Pinterest, but they're more so focused on, on platforms like LinkedIn, where it's like direct business to business type of sales. So it, it really ties into to who you're trying to target and which platforms you believe your target audience is on. But I am a firm believer in just get it on all the platforms, even if it takes off on one and not on the other, 
you never know that one or two people that click on it on Pinterest might end up being a conversion. So I recommend putting it on all of them, but then hyper-focusing and going a little above and beyond on the specific platforms that you think are most applicable to your business. Um, one thing that I think I've heard people talk about before and be curious for your take on is that, you know, you shouldn't take the exact same piece of content and exact same format and share it everywhere, right? You should tailor it. So, you know, maybe on Instagram, you have a shorter clip and on, you know, LinkedIn, you have a mid-sized clip on YouTube, you have the full clip. Like, can you speak to that? Like what does each platform like best, right? What is the ideal type of content and how could you maybe take one piece of content and create, you know, three different versions of it? Sure. It's definitely something I could take uh, some time to talk about. I actually just started my own podcast, the modern innovation show that's coming next coming next several weeks. So we're kind of kind of in the process of tailoring microform content for different platforms. As we speak, um, people definitely resonate with shorter pieces of content. So it's like, if you have a seven minute video on LinkedIn, you're not going to get as much exposure as if it's like a two minute video. So, so obviously on platforms like Instagram and TikTok. You want to keep it concise. People that are on those types of platforms usually are uh, kind of have a short attention span. They just want to see something quick and keep scrolling. But I think LinkedIn, you could do. I got I on my podcast. I interviewed like a pretty big LinkedIn LinkedIn influencer, if you want to call it that. On LinkedIn, I don't really know what the term on LinkedIn is, but he sure. said getting started, you should keep your videos right around a minute long. But as you get more attention and get better at creating videos like that two to three minute range is like a pretty, pretty feasible spot to be on LinkedIn. So yeah, it really var varies from platform to platform. And then on something like Twitter, maybe you go on Canva and you just do a really cool, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, just craft like a cool little picture that grabs attention and like some bullet points of what, uh, what you're going to learn from the video and maybe you get some exposure like that. And you can put that on, on something like Pinterest as well. And then just link to the URL in addition to that. So just being conscious of your platform and, and who's following you again are, are two of the most important things that you can do. So you should, should make a, a different version, right. For, for each platform. Um, even if it's the same core concept, same core piece of content. Definitely. And I mean, you um, can do, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, Instagram does have like the Instagram TV thing. Uh, but I think more often than not, especially if you're getting your feet off the ground, you're probably going to want to keep it fairly concise. Cool. Um, something that I've heard about, speaking of where to put your video, I've heard that video content on your website helps with SEO. Can you talk more it about It definitely that? does. Sure. So it, it ties back into that what's missing kind of philosophy that you, I take to content research. More often than not, these blog posts do not have YouTube videos. And when you think about it, it's like, all right, Google owns YouTube. So they're benefiting. It's like they're getting a double whammy here. They're getting people clicking from Google onto the article and then watching a video that they have monetized that they're making money from as well. So I would say, yes, putting, putting YouTube videos into your website is a great way to, to not only make Google happy, which is the main thing that you can do, but it's also going to increase session time. So if you have a 10 minute video on your blog post, there's, it's, there's speculation that it's a kind of a debate within the SEO community, but pretty much the majority of people that I talk to say that the amount of time you spend looking at a blog post or a video, it's definitely the case on YouTube, but I think Google as well the longer you spend on there, the more Google's going to think, all right, this is a quality piece of content. Let's rank it higher. So if you can add a 10 minute video and have people stay on your blog post for 10 more minutes, that's not only going to help the videos ranking, but it's going to help the blog post ranking as well. So most definitely would recommend it, especially as you're, as I could imagine you're finding with bomb bomb, people really resonate with video content. They love that face to face dialogue rather than text. So if you can have a video where you're chatting and kind of summarizing either a product or the content within a blog, I think people really resonate with that. And that's going to help with more conversions as well. So more viewers and hopefully more sales as a result as well. Now you mentioned, you know, that Google owns YouTube. So embedding a YouTube video is helpful. Um, do you know if Google's algorithm likes it when you embed like a, a Wistia video or a Vimeo video or something like that? Uh, is it still helpful? I think it would still be helpful because it still ties into that sessions uh, kind of thing. But, but as I mentioned, I do think that, <laughs> that 
Google enjoys that that double dip where they're getting benefits of YouTube monetization as well as the clicking on it from Google. So I think you could do video on other platforms, but I would probably recommend YouTube if you had the option on your uh, on your blog post or whatever it may be. Cool. Um, now, so now we've got we know what our topics are. We know where we're putting the videos, right? Um, and if, is there anything in particular you can do either in the video itself or even the, uh, the post in the written portion to really encourage more likes, more shares, more comments, stuff like that? Because of course, that's truly what you know gets these algorithms jump started, especially on like the social media LinkedIn side of things is that engagement. Is there anything in particular you can do to encourage that? Uh, the closed captions are super important. So when you think about it, it's like, if I'm sitting in the office place, looking at my cell phone, keep it trying to keep quiet so that people don't know that I'm not doing work. I'm not going to have the audio on. And more often than not, you'd be surprised how often people don't have the volume on when they're looking at these videos. So not only having closed captions, but another good tip that I got was know your target audience. So it's like, if your target audience is a 50 year old man, I don't know about you, but my dad's text on his phone, it's huge. So if, <laughs> if your target audience is like, an older group of people, you need to be conscious of the size of the closed captions as well. So even if it's only a few words on the screen, you're still better off having that if it means that the people that you're trying to appeal to can read it. Closed captions are really huge as far as conversions are concerned. So that I'd say is the biggest thing. All right. Yeah, I, I personally uh, haven't been using them just because I really want people to actually watch my video, not just read my words. But uh, I have heard you get more traction and more engagement with the closed captions on. So I'll probably start experimenting a little bit. Right. See what I <laughs> see what I think. All right. So closed captioning helps in that. Um, I know personally, one thing I've noticed just on LinkedIn, I'll supply, obviously this doesn't apply everywhere, but like on LinkedIn, some of those social platforms, um, it's good if you like ask a question in your video. Right. Um, notice that too like when I just teach something and that's it you know I get a moderate amount of traction but when I ask a question throw out my answer but invite people to share their answer you know, I tend to get a lot more people conversing so you know it probably wouldn't work on a blog post necessarily but um, you know on LinkedIn at least that seems to work well it definitely does LinkedIn's like my bread and butter as far as social media I've just I've always been obsessed with it and if you can get people engaging within the comments it's way up as far as how much viewership you get. So exactly right. Usually what I'll do is I'll either post a video or a, I like to do text posts as well, just cause I, I love writing too. Um, I'll usually add a stimulating kind of broad question and then I'll tag. Some people don't like tagging in the comments. I don't really have much of a problem with it cause it kind of sparked conversation with interesting people. So I'll usually tag like five or six people that I know will add thought provoking comments in the comment section. And that's a good way to really boost the exposure, at least with the, the LinkedIn algorithm. But I know that YouTube's huge on comments as well. So yeah, the more engagement that you can get, the better. And I mean, if somebody's willing to comment on your post, that would signify to me that they, that you're at least on their radar, you know what I mean? So it, it might be a sale immediately, or it might be a sale down the line, but either way, it's like, it's a good person to have within your inner circle. So definitely that that comment engagement is is a huge component um now for the the million dollar question which is really hard to answer um and for people who like want to give their video the best chance possible to go viral is there anything in particular you can do again either with the video or the typed out portion to give your video the best chance possible of going viral other than of course the things we just talked about sure so one of the biggest components of seo that i think is applicable with YouTube videos as well is called backlinks, which is essentially if you made a blog post about this video and linked back to the clean media website, that signifies to Google, all right, another website was willing to shout out my website. This clearly makes it a good website and it'll increase your authority. And what authority is, is how much Google values you as like a quote unquote quality website. So the more backlinks you can get to a blog post or just to your website in general, the better you're going to perform on Google. So it's a very similar mindset to if somebody links to your YouTube video or if an influencer shares your YouTube video, it's just going to be much easier to get a significant amount of clicks. So that backlinking strategy is something I'd recommend checking out further. That is probably 
one of, if not the most important component of SEO. Interesting. All right. So Google backlinking strategy, YouTube, and you'll probably find some, some good articles to read on it. Definitely. Yeah. It's huge. It's a big business too. People don't realize like if a wall street journal article links to another website, chances are somebody paid them money to, (laughs) to link back to them just because if, if you're getting a backlink from like a crappy no name website, it doesn't hurt, but it's not, it actually can hurt if it's like, if, Google has it as like a quote unquote toxic website. But if it's like, if like Disney.com or like a, a household name website links back to your website, that really tells Google like, all right, this website is legit. So, so just being conscious of who you're getting backlinks from, but creating quality enough content that people are going to feel comfortable to do it. It's going to be huge as far as ranking. Well, um, I guess, you know, as we wrap up here, uh, when it comes to the different, you know, social media platforms, um, is there any like platform specific advice you can give, right? How to get your, how to get traction on Instagram versus how to get traction on YouTube versus how to get traction on LinkedIn? Because mostly we've been talking universal concepts here. Is there anything that's platform specific that you could share? So I will say that this is somewhat universal, but it's especially on LinkedIn. It ties back into what I was saying about the comments. I've come to the realization that I actually have been playing with it myself on Instagram. Um, comment marketing is huge. So I don't know if you're active on Instagram, but if you go on like a, like a popular musicians page or like a meme page or something like that, there's thousands of comments that are like, click on my profile to see X, click on my profile to see this. And it's because people garner so much attention from the comment section. So if you can think of, I think this is really going to be the forward thinking approach to it rather than spamming just like a generic text. If you can beat the rush to comment on an Instagram post from somebody that's noteworthy, and I've been doing it myself, um, I'll like go on and see that somebody just made a post a minute ago about like a new album dropping or something like that, and I'll try and add like a witty comment, and it'll end up getting thousands of likes in that comment, be one of the top comments, and I'll see my profile get like hundreds of clicks that day. So I think just not only getting people to comment on your content but engaging with other people's content as well is going to be on any platform, your best bet to really garner exposure and, and really grow your account. But on LinkedIn, it's like bar none. The most important thing you can do is engage with other people's content. If you want to grow on there, not only because they'll return the favor, but if you add something really insightful to their post, they're going to say, Oh, this Jonathan, he's a bright guy. Like I want to be connected with him. So it's, it's a win-win because you're helping the other person out they're going to want to do it in return, but you're also going to show other people that are in their audience, like, wow, this guy's really got it together. <laughs> yeah. It's actually interesting. I didn't quite realize what a strategy that was, but the last few days that's been happening where I'll leave comments on someone's posts and I get like random connection requests from people who seem to be in the same industry as that person was. Um, I've also been taking this stra- ha- habit of, you know, I get that notification saying, Hey, Mary and 10 others liked your comment. I'll go get that list of 10 others and send them all connection requests. Exactly. Oh, exactly. I, I do the same strategy, thing. But, huh, Huge cool. strategy. That's the, the biggest influencers on LinkedIn. This guy, Jonathan Palmer, that I would recommend checking out his account. He's like, he works with Shay Robottom, who's probably like the biggest influencer on LinkedIn. He's coming. He's actually the first episode of my podcast that's coming in like the next several weeks. But he says he does 90% of the time, at least when he got started, I don't know about now, but I still see him commenting all the time. He did he produced his own content and released it 10% percent of the time. And the other 90% of the time that he was on LinkedIn, engaging with other people's posts, adding insightful comments. And as a result, he was able to grow. He went from zero followers at the beginning of the year. I think he's at like 25 K now just from really strategically adding great commentary. So (laughs) definitely, definitely a great approach. And the, the strategy that I found with pretty much any big name influencer on LinkedIn, but I think across the board, it's a really worthwhile investment to engage with other people's content. That's cool. All right. Well, thank you um, for all this, uh, all this information, man. Like, like I said, this is exactly what my weakness was. I had no idea how this whole world worked. So appreciate you taking the time to explain it to me. And I'm sure there's tons of people watching as well who are also having their eyes opened uh, for the first time to this whole world of SEO. Um, I'm sure there'll be people who hear this who want to get in contact with you, either just to know you socially or, you know, to talk to you about the work that you do. Um, What is the best way for people to get in contact with you? 
Sure. So, um, yeah, I have, I'm, I'm doing the, the SEO stuff with clean media. So you could shoot me an email at Harrison at clean media marketing.com or just reach out with me via LinkedIn. As I said, I'm like <laughs> big LinkedIn buff over here. Uh, I'm also doing some freelance writing and content strategy stuff on my own and I'm happy to help it or even give some pro bono advice to anybody that might be interested. Um, and additionally, I also have the podcast coming out in coming weeks, the modern innovation show. So, uh, I, that'll be something that I'll be promoting through my LinkedIn and I'll hopefully have a website set up for that soon enough as well. So those are the, the three big things that I'd like to plug today. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I'm, I'm connected with you on LinkedIn. So I'll keep my eyes and ears out for that podcast when it launches. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Jonathan. It's been an absolute pleasure.